Let's talk Las Cruces. Weekdays from 9 till noon on the station for news, talk, and sports. KSNM 570. I'm Randy Harris, and we've got uh, some fantastic guests today. We are going to be speaking with Jim Gottstein, the executive director of Psych Rights. Uh, Jim's an attorney that helped to win a $1.5 billion judgment for illegal marketing of the drug. Help me pronounce that. Zyprexa? Zyprexa. Zyprexa. Thanks. Hi, Jim. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. And uh, also in the studio, uh, we have Al Galves, one of our local guys. Good morning, Al. Hi. Hi, Ken- Hi Randy. All right. Good morning. Uh, and we're going to have a, a fascinating dialogue about uh, the pharmaceutical marketing business, uh, profits over patient care, and stuff like that. Um, it's going to be fascinating. Uh, Jim, you know, in this first little segment, we've got about two more minutes. Could you give us a, a thumbnail uh, introduction to uh, to what the situation is that, that we're addressing here? Well, um, the Law Project for Psychiatric Rights, Psych Rights, has a mission of uh, mounting a strategic litigation campaign against forced psychiatric drugging and electroshock around the country. Mm. Um, and And what's happened is that Basically, um, we've not been told the truth about these drugs, and so people think it's a good idea to uh, drug people that experience, uh, you know, basically go crazy. Um, that's uh, when they say they don't want them, that they should be forced to, and it really is counterproductive. It decreases the, the possibility of people getting better dramatically, and uh, actually people in the public mental health system are dying 25 years earlier than the general population as a result. And then the worst thing, uh, even worse than that, is this um, massive drugging of children, especially poor mm-hmm. children, mm-hmm. Uh, because basically they're being children and not, you know, and not doing what the adults want them to. And so we say there's something wrong with them and give them these drugs that... Uh, are very harmful to them. Wow, this is going to be intense. About you're talking about forced drugging and um, and electroshock therapy, and it, it also not just for adults but for kids. This is this is pretty shocking. No, no pun intended. I mean, this is pretty stunning. I didn't realize that we were forcing electroshock therapy and and uh, forcing people to be drugged. That's, however, inaccurate. That's what we're doing. Is that correct? Oh, yes, and it's really gotten quite pervasive. It used to be that people were uh, drugged against their will only inside the psychiatric hospitals. But now they have what they call outpatient commitment, where people are ordered to take these drugs uh, in the community. And they have, in some places, um, they even have what they call these assertive community uh, treatment teams that will go to people's houses and knock on their doors and, you know, make sure people are taking their drugs. And, and in fact, um, sometimes people are giving these long-acting injections uh, because people... These drugs really have horrific effects. They, they basically are um, chemical lobotomies. They block 70 to 90 percent of the dopamine transmission in the frontal lobe, so it's fair to call them uh, chemical lobotomies. And so they basically, people are disturbing to other people, and so these drugs just basically make them incapable of being disturbing, and rather than address the the situation and circumstances which is causing people to, you know, behave that way, it's just, like I say, a chemical lobotomy. And so now they're doing that in the community as well. This is astonishing, Jim. So let me let me ask a question. I'm sure the listeners would be asking themselves, well, what what is the situation that prompts that? Are these people who uh, you know need this sort of uh, this sort of treatment, or are uh, and are unwilling to uh, unwilling to stay on their meds or do whatever it is they need to do, or are the you know how does one find oneself in a situation where what was the name of that team that that, that goes out? They're called ACT teams, Assertive Community Treatment, or PAC teams, Program for Assertive Community Treatment. Gee, that sounds so. That sounds so nurturing. Uh, right, and I think actually, and Al knows, yeah, Al knows this. I think that there's been an effort in 
uh, New Mexico to uh, pass a law for this uh, outpatient commitment, and that's been beaten back the last few years. So uh, I think New Mexico is one of the few states that doesn't have it. Assertive community teams, does that equate to a couple of guys show up at your door and hold you down and give you an injection against your will? If you don't take it, they'll, they uh, can get an order to take you to the hospital, and then they'll do that. Assertive community teams. That's kind of like the Clean Air Act, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's, so is, is this, Al, do you know anything about this happening here in New Mexico? Oh, it goes on here in Las Cruces. We have assertive community treatment teams and coming it, out of that's Southwest. That's real common. Yeah, it goes on basically in every uh, large city in this, in this state. And are these people who are somehow mandated to to be taking some sort of medication? Yeah, they're mandated by, by court order. Mm-hmm. Well, in New Mexico, you can't mandate a person who's not in the hospital by court order, as Jim pointed out. It's, that, that law has been introduced in our legislature for about five times uh, in recent years and has been beaten down by basically people who uh, make the argument that this is really a, a violation of human rights, and, mm-hmm. and it's not effective. Uh, the evidence says that when you force people to take drugs, it really doesn't help very much, and it hurts more than it helps. And so, thank God, New Mexico is one of only eight states uh, where you can't do that. You can't court order a person outside of the hospital to be treated with drugs. But what the, the power that's behind it is mm-hmm. that you can't get treated. In other words, if you go to Southwest Counseling and you get diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia, mm-hmm. they will not treat you if you don't take the drugs. That's where the compulsion comes in. Mm-hmm. And also lots of times, I don't know about Las Cruces, but in many places, you know, people are on disability and, and they have, uh, you know, subsidized housing and some kind of housing support, and people w- won't be allowed to... Uh, have their housing unless they take their drugs. Wow, so it's all tied in. It's all tied together. Yeah. So, uh, Jim, uh, you, you, you run a project called the Law Project for Psych- Psychiatric Rights. Can you give us a, you know, kind of an overview of what that organization is about? Well, our mission is to mount a strategic litigation campaign against forced psychiatric drugging and electroshock. And a, and a few years ago, we um, started well, actually, more than a few years ago, we decided we really had to try and address and focus on this massive drugging of children, especially mm-hmm. poor children. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we've come up with is that, well, most of the psychiatric drugging of children, the worst of it, um, is uh, children on Medicaid. Hmm. And it turns out that most of the psychiatric drugs given to children on Medicaid is not properly covered under Medicaid. And so it constitutes Medicaid fraud. And there's a federal statute that allows people to sue on behalf of the government to uh, recover for that fraud and share in what, you know, whatever is won, if anything. And um, in each false claim, it's called the False Claims Act, each false claim carries a minimum penalty of five thousand five hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and so our idea is um, to sue some of these psychiatrists uh, and figure that well, any psychiatrist worth their salt would have prescribed at least a thousand of these, and that's five and a half million dollars. And our idea is not so much the money, but to you know scare the other psychiatrists into stopping it because these drugs basically have not been shown to be effective in children. They have caused all sorts of problems. And Congress has said that we're not going to pay for off-label prescriptions unless there's scientific support for it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's one idea. And then the other idea is to um, sue the pharmacy that is, is filling it because the doctors are causing the false claim by making the prescription, and the pharmacies are submitting the Betting. false claims. Yeah. And the idea is that the, a big pharmacy, at least, will have um, enough money to interest the lawyers because the person getting, you know, bringing the suit maybe gets 25%. It varies, but that's roughly 25%. And the lawyer might get a third or 40% of that. Mm-hmm. And so a uh, psychiatrist might have a million, million or so. And that's, you know, when you cut the slices out of that, that's, 
not too exciting to a lawyer, but a big pharmacy, um, well, that's, you know, sure, that could be exciting. And we have, a, we actually have a form complaint that on our website, psychrights.org, that people can use. And we're very interested in, in helping people bring these suits and even uh, will participate if, you know, if we requested. Okay, so if people want more information on what you're doing, it's psychrights.org. It's P-S-Y-C-H-R-I-G-H-T-S dot O-R-G. So, you know, the, the underlying challenge here is this, you know, is this tendency to, uh, to drug everybody. Uh, you know, you got kids that don't want to sit still in their seats at school. I mean, you know, dial us in on this. Uh, you know, when when we were kids, we didn't like to sit still in our seats at school either. But there wasn't somebody right around the corner that was going to mandate us to be drugged. You know, what what the heck is going on? What what the heck is going on in our culture that causes uh, the sort of, uh, you know, the need for you, folks like yourselves to address this? Why are we drugging all of our kids? Is it because there's a profit in it? Well, sure. And, and I think maybe, should we let Al talk a little bit? Because so, I think he's got some uh, insights into this sure. as well. Sure. What do you think, Al? Well, I, I think basically it seems like an easy answer. And, uh, quick fix. A yeah, it's a quick fix. Let's, let's take a school situation. Okay. Uh, kids not sitting in a seat, uh, being disturbing in various ways, not doing his work, uh, talking to other kids. Sounds uh, like a kid to me. Yeah, there could be all kinds of Can't reasons. Have that. Right? He, the kid may not, may not be interested in what's going on. Uh, the kid may not be able to do the work and feels bad about it and, and wants to disrupt things mm -hmm. for that reason. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's stuff going on at home that's really upsetting to him. His or parents maybe he's just happy. a kid, and the idea of sitting a kid in a seat for six hours a day is almost completely absurd. Right. Exactly. So uh, the, the, the school has a choice. They can change the environment. They can change their program. In other words, provide kids with a, a, a greater variety of things they can do, mm -hmm. be more open to addressing the needs of individual kids, or they can medicate them. And, and basically, when you medicate them, they, they're, uh, chemically, they're, they're able to focus better. So, but question, quick question now. My son goes to school. He's, uh, let's say, he's 8 or 10 years old or whatever. You know, I don't know where this, where this, this problem begins to manifest. But, uh, and, uh, you know, he's kind of squirmy or squirrely or, you know, he acts like a kid. Um, what happens then? Do, does the school call me do i go say oh my goodness what are we going to do we need to drug this boy how, how does it what's what's the transition process the school basically talks to the parent and okay. says this child needs to be drugged so does the parent make the decision yeah basically the parent makes the decision but there's a lot of pressure from the school okay the school's saying look if you don't do this uh, we're going to put the kid into special education okay or we're going to put him into a behavior mod class or something mm -hmm. There's a lot of pressure there. So, mm -hmm. And there's stigma that goes along with those and things. And there's stigma also. That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways it's an easy answer, but it doesn't work very well. There's, there's research that shows that kids that get medicated with Ritalin, for instance, mm -hmm. or Adderall or those kinds mm -hmm. of things, uh, they don't do better academically. They don't do well socially either over, over time, over a long time period. They actually, it affects their growth, so they don't grow. They their have, physical growth. Their physical growth. Uh, so it has some pretty bad side effects, and, it, and the problem, it doesn't help kids learn how to, how to manage their own thoughts. Or, you know, all of us have to learn how to filter out, how to focus our attention somehow or other. Mm -hmm. And it's an important thing we need to learn. We're well, still working on it, yeah. yeah you're right. <laughs> the drugs don't help you do that. Uh, I, that's why I'm listening so acutely. <laughs> this is not an avenue. Learn. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's the easy answer problem. And, you know, so it's in some ways easier for the parents. They don't have to worry about how they're treating the kid. The school has an easy answer. It doesn't have to do something to change the way it, its curriculum or the way it helps kids or... So it sounds like there are a lot of forces, a lot of forces and pressures that 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 also support this quote solution. Yeah. You know, here I am. I'm working my butt off. Uh, you know, both parents working two or three jobs. You know, the school calls and says uh, your your child's uh, misbehaving. We suggest that he be she he or she be uh, put on these drugs. Uh, the alternative is uh, some sort of uh, you know uh, remedial uh, uh, class process at at the school or you know, you could bring your kid home and homeschool them. Mm -hmm. You have that option. And yeah. I mean, I, surely 
but, but of course you can't do that because you got to work all the time. It right. could, it, it can get worse too, How's which that? is, which is that some, and I don't know if it's happening in Las Cruces, but in most places around the country, the the child protective services will Ooh. come in and say that you are neglecting the medical needs of your child by not medicating them. And Based on this recommendation by the school? Yes. And, wow. yes. And, <laughs> um, and they will threaten to take the, the child away mm. from the parent or parents if they don't drug them. And, that, and they do take the child away. This happens. The school suggests this, and if the parents don't comply... Um, the Child Protective Services will show up and say, you're not drugging your children uh, in accordance with what uh, uh, the school nurse, I don't know if I'm oversimplifying this, suggests. Therefore, we're going to take your child. This happens? Yes. Oh, my God. Does, is it happening in Las Cruces? Uh, God, I hope to not. To your knowledge, Al? Uh, I, I don't know of any case in which it's happened, but I'm, my guess is that it, that it does happen. Are, are kids getting electroshock too, Jim? Yes. Uh, again, I don't know about New Mexico, uh, but children are getting uh, shocked, and uh, in some places uh, they're they're getting shocked even against their parents' uh, objections. I, th- this is stunning. It's like state control. It, you, mm-hmm. Go ahead. You know, you know, I was thinking, uh, uh, just trying listening to myself, and I was thinking, boy, this kind of sounds like you know conspiracy theorists, you know, lunatic fringe type stuff. But um, it actually is happening. It's and, real. Uh, yeah. So what 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 drives it? You know, what's behind it? You know, how uh, how pervasive is it? Uh, what can we do about it? Well, I think. Um, you know what? What can we do about it? I've got a lot of thoughts about that. But but basically, what what happened is that is that the psychiatric industry, which was in crisis in the 1970s, uh, maybe a little bit before, um, because they were having all this competition from non medical doctor uh, therapists, they basically turned to this really medical model that there's something wrong with people's brains, um, and that's never been proven. And they formed an alliance with the pharmaceutical industry mm-hmm. to turn it into you know, a medical problem that needs to be treated with drugs. And then, um, and then there, it's just been a huge, uh, hugely successful marketing effort, uh, and they've recently come out with the latest edition, the fifth edition of what they, the DSM, the Diagnostic mm-hmm. and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, mm-hmm. Um, and they, you know, they're, I don't know, what other, it's grown from something like 100 diagnoses to 500, and they keep adding diagnoses and, and uh, loosening the standards. And so basically every human em- emotion now is considered a disease to be treated with drugs, a and disorder, it's just hugely disease. profitable. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this is what's happened. You know, it used to be that people, you'd say, where they're shy. Yeah. A shy person. Now yeah. they get diagnosed with social anxiety disorder. That's a disorder. Yeah, that's a disorder. <laughs> or, or, you know, a person was volatile, maybe irritable, volatile, yeah. could blow up. That's now a they disorder. Now di- they get di- bipolar disorder. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Or, or uh, it, it, this, is, this is what's happening is what used to be just considered to be, well, that person's different. Or sure. That's kind that's of the way they are. Now, they, now yeah. it's a disorder. Now, you, now you've got a disease. And you get drunk. You know, I, I had the experience with uh, my boy. We we read, uh, when he was a kid, we read a story about the uh, young life of Thomas Edison. Now, Thomas Edison was, he, he was bouncing off the walls. He was, you know, he, uh, you know he, he was too much for his little one room, classroom, uh, school room. He, uh, you know, for Christ's sake, he blew up his dad's tool shed, uh, you know, tinkering and inventing stuff. But by the time he was 10 or 12, you know, he was riding up and down the rails across the country, picking up news stories, getting to one end, typing them, uh, printing a paper, all this stuff he had negotiated with the, with the uh, railroad so that he had his own car. Uh, and then on the way back, he was selling newspapers. And then Thomas Edison went on and on. And we, you know, we pretty much know the rest of the story. Now, Thomas Edison would have been subjected to 
some sort of pharmaceutical intervention or even electroshock therapy in today's world. Is that pretty likely? Yeah, I think it is. Well, you know, the story of Picasso, when Picasso was uh, 10 years old, mm -hmm. his teachers were upset because all he wanted to do was paint. That's a, there's a disorder, isn't that? Yeah. Isn't that some sort of a yeah. disorder? It's an obsessive painting disorder. Yeah, OPD. Yeah, I, I've heard about that. <laughs> you know, and Ernest Hemingway uh, committed suicide after electroshock because he could no longer write. Let's talk about electroshock. Uh, I wasn't aware that that was still, and, and perhaps most of us aren't. What's the, what's the prevalence of the use of electroshock therapy in this country? Well, the... There's no statistics that are are really kept as far as I know, but 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 the kind of the number that gets thrown around all the time is 200,000 uh, people a year. Okay. And there's a terrific book by Linda Andre called Doctors of Deception, what, uh, what they don't want you to know about electroshock, that really goes through the history and the science and the politics and the abdication of the Food and uh, Drug Administration, the FDA, from properly regulating the electroshock machines. Um, so I highly recommend that book. Doctors of Deception? Mm -hmm. And the author again is? Linda Andre, A-N-D-R-E. Is that a relatively new book? Uh, yes, well, certainly, uh, I think within the last five years. Wow. It's astonishing. You know, you hear little bits and pieces of this, you know, in the media. Um, it, I... I so it sounds like collusion. I mean, you, you know, you referenced, uh, you know, oh, this sounds a little weird, it sounds like conspiracy theory or something, but if, in fact, these things are happening, if, in fact, the schools, the state, the doctors, the, uh, the you know, the I guess the hospitals, I, I don't know who all is involved in this, they can come in and determine that your child uh, has to be treated in some capacity, and if you don't comply, they take that child away from you. This can happen. Right. And, and I really try not to ascribe bad motives oh. to people. And that I greed? think. Greed? Well, I mean, the pharmaceutical companies, the drug companies, um, they, you know, they are really doing evil stuff. And that, it seems like they have to know that. I mean, they hide the data. They. Um, you know, they say that, you know, the, this data is our uh, trade secrets. Hmm. Um, they've, uh, you know, uh, the Zyprexa, for example, they hid that it, that it caused diabetes um, and other uh, metabolic problems. I mean, people regularly gain uh, 100 pounds in six months on hmm. Zyprexa. And there's this other drug, which is uh, a neuroleptic, and it was developed to street skip treat schizophrenia and they're mis mislabeled uh, or you know mar they're called antipsychotics but they don't really have much antipsychotic properties so so I call them neuroleptics and that's that's what they they started out being called and there's another drug called risperdal which has a maybe not quite as bad a, a uh, weight and diabetes profile but bad enough and it it causes uh, boys to grow the young boys to grow breasts and lactate and uh, prepubertal girls to grow uh, breasts and lactate. It's called gynecomasty. And um, so these drugs just really, especially these neuroleptics, this newer uh, generation, really disrupt the metabolic system. Are these, are these drugs tested on to be, you know, and proven to be safe for kids, or is this another one of those things where... You know, well, you know, if you're, a, if you're an adult and you take it, uh, then if you're a small person, you should just take half as much. I mean, wh what's the deal? Well, there's a lot of off-label prescribing right. where, and where there's not been any testing. Now, there's some testing uh, that's done on children, and, and the, the, there's a little incentive uh, for drug companies to test on children, which is they get a couple years extended patent life. Mm -hmm. And so Zyprexa and Risperdal, for example, have been approved down to 13 or 10 for different um, conditions like schizophrenia or the manic phase of bipolar disorder. But anyway, just the idea that a child can be diagnosed with bipolar disorder is ridiculous. But we're seeing regularly um, 
four- and five-year-olds being given these drugs. We've seen six-month-old uh, babies being given these drugs. No. Um, and these were designed for uh, adults, developed for adults with schizophrenia. Now, you tell me what a, you know, what a psychotic baby looks like. And yeah, psychotic yeah, well, looks like. I mean, there's been a there's been a forty fold increase in the in the prescribing of these antipsychotics that Jim's talking about for kids over the last ten years. Uh, what happens is a, a parent brings a kid in to uh, see a psychiatrist or a doctor, and the kids having temper tantrums, and the parents having a hard time dealing with the temper tantrums, and a volatile kid, let's say, hard to hard to manage. And the kid gets diagnosed with bipolar disorder, could be mm-hmm. five, six, seven, eight years old, and put on these drugs that Jim's talking about, very powerful drugs. So uh, it's, it's, and as, as Jim points out, kids can't give informed consent. It's a big problem. Mm-hmm. A, a kid doesn't have that ability. So, well, it uh, doesn't have that authority. Uh, the authority can't do it. So, and, and you asked a question about why, what's going on here? How, how has this all happened? Uh, I think a lot of forces at work. One of them is, you know, this seems to be uh, just another advance of scientific medicine. You know, we've done this great stuff with medicine. You know, we have transplants. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we cured polio, malaria, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have these great psychotropic drugs that cure mental illness. Mm. It seems like that's going on. And the drug companies have done amazing advertising, as you know. You see the advertisements. You oh, feel sure. bad, take sure. uh, Abilify. Yeah. Uh, take uh, Prozac, take uh, Effexor, whatever it is. Uh, so there's a lot of, and it seems like an easy answer. Well, uh, one thing, it, um, it, it, there's also a really excellent book called Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker. If people want right. to understand the the big picture on what's happened with the psychiatric in, industry and how we've had this explosion of people um, that... Uh, that have been labeled with mental illness and given these drugs and then become disabled. Uh, wow. That's uh, that. This is a great book. It's called Anatomy of an Epidemic. Whitaker, James, Robert, Robert, Robert yeah, Robert yeah. Whitaker, and he and he gives you the evidence there. He, he's a science writer. He believes in science, so it's not just he's not giving his opinions. He's looked at all the studies, and basically what he finds is that. If you take these drugs for a long amount of time, mm-hmm. you're gonna you're gonna be worse off than if you didn't, mm-hmm. and you're gonna you're gonna be hurting. You're gonna be disabled. And sometimes, the the impact of them they can knock down symptoms in the short sure. run. Sure. Uh, but if you and they're not dealing with the cause. This nope. is the problem. They're not dealing with the cause of the problem, the cause of the symptoms, uh, and they have all bad side effects and high relapse rates, et cetera, et cetera. So. What he found was for all of these drugs, if you take them for a long amount of time, you're in trouble. Mm-hmm. And, and this is a problem because this, the conventional wisdom now, for instance, for people who are diagnosed with schizophrenia, you've got to stay on the drugs for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the research shows that actually the people who recover, and some people do recover mm-hmm. from schizophrenia, are people who don't take the drugs or haven't taken them. So there are approaches that work. In Finland, for instance, let me tell you listen, a little bit about in Finland what they do. Uh, There's a guy named Hako Sekula who developed a program. First sign of, of, of schizophrenia, in other words, a person starts to have hallucinations, mm-hmm. delusions, uh, disorganized thinking. They get everybody in that person's life together. Uh, uh, parents, uncles, aunts, spouses, b- mm-hmm. boy- boyfriends, girlfriends, coaches, mentors, teachers, mm-hmm. friends. Paper boy. A, a paper boy. Get them into a room, and they meet every day or every other day for two or three weeks, and they're just trying to understand what happened. Okay. What has happened here? Uh, and the, the person who Human who's rather than chemical intervention. Exactly, because what they're trying to do is, is understand what went on here, what triggered this, this, uh, this move by this psyche to go into this direction. Mm-hmm. And uh, they have a, a recovery rate of about 80%. That's great. If they catch it early, mm-hmm. early the first break, 80% recovery rate. And no drug, only drugs in the, in the worst circumstances where a person might be in danger of hurting themselves or hurting someone else. Right. Other than that, no. So there are other approaches that do work. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about that, Jim? No, there's no question about that. And there was a uh, study done by the National Institute of Mental Health in the 1970s called Soteria, which uh, had a similar approach. 
um, and they had similar results. And, and basically that was right when the pharmaceutical uh, juggernaut was rolling over everything and mm-hmm. crushing it. And, and uh, basically when the study was ended, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health said, okay, that's, as, that's interesting, a study over. And then they fired the guy that uh, conducted the study. They I mean, didn't like the they results. didn't really fire him. He went on a leave of absence, and, uh, yes. went, and then and then they said he would have his job when he came back, and and, they, and he didn't. And yeah. so, um, so this is well proven. And one of the things that's interesting is that there are many people who have recovered after being given up. You know, told that they you know would be mentally ill for uh, the rest of their lives, and and uh, they they. Uh, Develop programs, and and really, it turns out that that they're the experts um, in in recovery because they're the ones that did it. They're the ones that believe in it, um, and uh, and so there are programs, peer-run programs, they're called, uh, and there are some really good ones being developed around the country as mm-hmm. well. So there are lots of other other programs. Now, I will say that. I do know people that find the drugs helpful, and, you know, and adults, you know, if mm-hmm. they want to take them, that's fine. But nobody should ever be forced to take them, and children shouldn't be uh, given them. And, um, and, he, and people should be told the truth about them, mm-hmm. including that there are these other approaches, such as uh, Alice just, you know, mentioned, that work far better for people without the harmful effects. How can people find out more about the this overall situation? Are there some links or some websites, perhaps, to look to? Well, there's psychrights.org, P-S-Y-C-H-R-I-G-H-T-S dot org. And then Al is just uh, leaving as executive director of this organization called um, the International Society, Society for Ethical Psychology and Psychiatry. And their website is psychintegrity.org. Org, isn't that right? Right, uh, psychintegrity.org. Yeah, and they have a, there's a lot of really good information there. And, then, and they do a really terrific annual conference this year. It'll be in uh, Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, mm. in uh, early November. Mm. And, uh, you know, and so the, uh, some of the best uh, science on, on what's going on gets presented there, and it's a great group of people. Yeah, basically that organization, really what we do is advocate for safe, humane, life-enhancing approaches. We understand that some people experience quote-unquote mental illnesses, and it's not fun. I've been through it myself. I've been severely depressed. And it is really an illness in the sense that it keeps people from living a decent life or the way they want to live, or it's, mm-hmm. it's very debilitating. Mm-hmm. So we understand that people do suffer, mm-hmm. but we th- what we want people to be to have available to them is good approaches to helping them mm-hmm. that really are going to help especially over the long run and i should say that jim himself has started the soteria house in anchorage alaska there is a soteria house in anchorage that was started basically by jim and other people where people can go when they're experiencing psychotic symptoms mm-hmm. then go and they'll just be able to live there and be safe be safe psychologically and, and physically with a staff that just will help them go through the experience. There, there's really a tremendous amount of information on psychrights.org. And then okay. there's this madinamerica.com, yeah, which, which really has a lot of, of important information. Uh, it's a blog, basically, and it's got a lot of really knowledgeable bloggers, and, uh, including psychiatric survivors and uh, people who have recovered and clinicians that have figured out what's going on and parents and those kind of things. So that's another really tremendous resource. Mad so Mad in America. America. Um, okay, great. Right. You know, gentlemen, uh, I know we're just scratching the surface here, uh, but we're, we're going to have to wrap up here in the next couple of minutes. Uh, Jim, is there anything else you'd like to touch on before we go today? Well, the, I guess the, the big one is we've got this Medicaid fraud initiative for ch- children and youth, and um, you know, if people are interested in pursuing that, go to the, the website psychrights.org and look it over. And we're really interested in, in helping people get going on that because this this drugging of children is is an unfolding national tragedy. Mm. That when the country wakes up, it's just going to be aghast at at what we've done to, uh, to our children. Wow, it's astonishing, Al. 
Well, I'll just say, you know, one of the things that is true, the, the Food and Drug Administration is supposed to protect us from this kind of thing. The problem is that uh, the, the drug companies only have to present two trials that show that their drug was more effective, quote-unquote, than, than placebo. There could be 20 trials that were failures. They don't have to tell the FDA about that. There's a guy named Irving Kirsch who looked at all of them mm -hmm. for antidepressants. He found mm -hmm. that he, when he looked at all of them, that antidepressants were not more effective than placebo. People on sugar pills did just as well as the people on the antidepressants. So you know, it's, it's fascinating. Um, we, we're, we're down to our last uh, about 40 seconds here. Um, I hope folks picked up on those websites. That's uh, psychrights.org. Is that correct, Jim? Yes. And uh, there's some other places we can look. We can look at things like madinamerica.com. Uh, we've recommended a couple of good books. Psychintegrity.org. Psychintegrity.org. And Anatomy of an Epidemic is a great book if you want to see the evidence for what we're saying. All right. Well, you know, thank you both so very much. Uh, thank you, Jim, for taking your time calling in from Alaska. I hope things cool off up there. I hear you're in a heat wave. <laughs> it's pretty nice. All right. Uh, we're going to have to run. Jim Gottstein, Al Gals, thanks so much for being here. been a pleasure to have you.